And we are live. Sorry for the couple of minutes delay, folks. Uh, my name's Carmen Drawl, and I'm here for the CNE News Google Hangout about the top chemistry of 2013. I'm here with Lauren Wolf. Hello. And some special guests. We've got Laura Howes here from Science in School, formerly at Chemistry World. Hi, guys. And I've got Ash Chigalakar, a uh, blogger at the Scientific American Network and their Curious Wave function. Hi there. Thank you all so much for listening in and uh, joining the party. We are going to talk top chemistry moments of 2013. So let's just and get right. And we are live. Sorry for the couple of minutes delay, folks. Uh, my name's Carmen Drawl, and I'm here for Sorry. A little bit of an echo. All right, I think it's gone now. Ah, OK, good. Sorry, technical, technical difficulties, Google. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I just want to start with question one, which is, what is your top chemistry moment of 2013? Where do you want to go first? <laughs> don't everybody jump in at once. <laughs> <laughs> Laura, why don't you go first? OK, well, um, actually, my probably two big highlights uh, this last year actually came in January, and they were two big uh, sort of DNA uh, chemistry uh, research papers that came out, one of which was David Lee with his artificial rituxane, which was helping build a, a peptide, which has really interesting uh, applications, I think, for starting to build novel peptides with strange amino acids and things like that. And I thought it was really interesting to start taking what we think of as biological machinery and really building it from the bottom up as a, as a, as a chemical machine. Um, and the other one, just because I thought it was neat, uh, was the, uh, the EBI paper that came out um, about making uh, DNA as a storage medium and using that as a really information-dense storage medium, if you think about it's so long-lasting and so uh, information-dense. And really, we're starting to now have the technology that means we can actually start writing and reading this stuff in a way that we can start really trying to manipulate it. So those were my two real highlights. So um, this may sound biased, but my favorite chemistry moment was probably the Nobel Prize in Chemistry uh, for 2013. And um, well, it's, it's not just because I am a computational chemist, but I think it really sort of uh, told you, it sort of sent the message that an entire field has come of age. And it uh, underscored how widely used these uh, methods have become, uh, not just in the hands of uh, theoretical chemists, not just in the hands of specialized theoretical chemists, uh, but also in the hands of experimental chemists. So there's a lot of uh, methods, computational methods, that the three Nobel Prize winners uh, from last year developed, uh, which are now essentially very easy to use and which are reliable enough um, to give mostly correct answers, especially for simple problems. Uh, so that was definitely my favorite moment. Uh, I do want to highlight another discovery, which was made at the end of the year. And um, uh, that was uh, in the field of drug discovery, but it was also essentially a chemistry paper. And this was work uh, done by Kevin Shokat and Jim Wells and their labs at uh, UC San Francisco. And what they essentially did was uh, they found inhibitors for the protein RAS. And that, uh, in my opinion, is a major breakthrough because RAS is a protein uh, which has been considered undruggable until now. And people have been trying to find inhibitors for it for at least 40 years, if not more. And I think this is the first time that uh, we now have a serious inhibitor discovery which really points the way forward uh, to, to drug design. Um, OK, I'll go next. This is Lauren. Uh I, um, one of the big things for me this year, and again, maybe I sound biased, uh, biased a little bit like Ash, um, was something I wrote about. It's, um, it's a neuroscience uh, method. I'm a, I'm a chemical neuroscience reporter here at CNN, so um, there's the reason for my bias. But there was this method called Clarity that came out this year, and basically it's a way, uh, completely chemistry, although important for neuroscience, um, that they used to make brain tissue uh, transparent. This is something that people have been working on for a long time, um, but this is the first time it's worked to such a such a such an extent. Um, what they did was they infiltrated small brains. They uh, did a whole bunch of 
tests on mouse brains and things like that, regular human brain tissue, and they infiltrated it with polymeric monomers and a heat-activated um, trigger, and they basically gelled the brain, and then um, and then were able to sort of anchor all of the nerves and proteins into place, and then suck out all of the lipids, which are the things that are you know, make it difficult to see through tissue. Um, they were able to suck those out with an electrophoretic method, and you got these really cool uh, brain maps, um, which you know is a is a big thing this year with the Brain Initiative being announced by President Obama. And so I think the neuroscience community is really excited about this because they think it'll be really helpful in, in getting a better map of the brain. Yeah, all really good uh, findings, and I guess. Some of them on the maybe the borders of what might be considered chemistry, I don't know, but uh, mine is curiosity. It has to be, I mean, for me, the fact that a chemical discovery, that chemical methods were able to show that Mars was um, at some point in its history habitable, that microbial life could have survived on Mars um, as uh, folks probably know, uh, Curiosity has been, um, that. well, the in, in results were announced in March. Um, Curiosity had a, has a suite of analytical instruments, and it revealed that about 20 to 30 percent of this gray-green Mars rock powder that it was analyzing is uh, composed of a mineral called smectite, which, uh, which forms in water. And uh, the rock contains, um, it, it's it, it contrasts, it, it's, a, it's a neutral pH, and that contrasts with more acidic environments that have been found on Mars. Um, the quote, I think, from the, uh, the Curiosity Project scientist said something to the effect of, we found an environment so benign on Mars that if you lived there, you would have been able to drink the water. Um, <laughs> leave, it, leave it to NASA to come up with a good quote. But um, I, I do think that it underscores what what was a huge discovery about um, the you know, solar system in which we live and also a very much chemical discovery. And I, and I know that Ash has uh, blogged it pretty extensively about curiosity as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, t the thing which people sometimes forget about curiosity is that it's essentially a very sophisticated chemistry lab. And uh, there's obviously a lot of, so what is interesting to me is that we always keep talking about chemistry as the central science. And this is a great example of uh, something which is at the intersection of uh, instrumentation, chemistry, and astronomy. And uh, hopefully we'll see more of that intersection uh, in, in the coming few years. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think there's, a, there's also the bit that yeah, this instrumentation is about the size of a car, this, this rover which we've sent off to Mars and is quite happily doing it on its own up there. You know, you can't go and tweak it when it starts to have a problem. It's got to be robust and it's got to be able to perform those, you know, experiments and that, that analysis really securely, robustly, repetitively, you know, without an engineer to come and help you when you've uh, got something stuck. Mm -hmm. I think one of the great things about Curiosity, too, is you know, everybody loves space, you know. The general public is much more fascinated with outer space than, than, than unfortunately, basic chemistry. But <laughs> this is one way that, you know, chemists can sort of get, get, get a little time with the general public. I mean, I don't know. I wouldn't sell clarity short either on that. I mean, the brain is something, I mean, that sort of stuff borders on philosophy a little bit. I mean, what is... It, what is consciousness chemically? What is memory chemically? All of, all, you know, emotional, all these, we, even though the science gets a little bit garbled, maybe a lot bit garbled, you know how much people like oxytocin. <laughs> um, I just want to interject and just say we're live for people joining us just now. Um, we are discussing the top chemistry uh, moments of 2013 and what to watch in 2014. This is uh, Chemical and Engineering News Google Hangout. Um, yeah, so I, there, there's a lot of stuff that went on in 2013, is there? And there were a lot of reviews and top lists that were posted elsewhere. Did anybody have any thoughts on those lists? Anything that maybe was missed? Anything good? Anything bad? Well, I think... 
or Lara. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say, I think you've got to remember with these lists that often they're coming at them from different points of view. If you're looking at the more general uh, science magazines, when they're trying to cover everything rather than just chemistry. So I always think it's a win if you get, in a, you know, a list of 10, you get two good chemistry stories in there, which I think, you know, you, you can argue you do with things like Clarity and um, looking at, at Curiosity, both of which you mentioned, and a couple of others. Um, and then you get the more sort of specialist, you know, uh, angles. Obviously, CEDN, Chemistry World, are both, are both done their sort of general chemistry, but trying to cover a broad range. And they're obviously trying to cover, you know, something, as a little bit of something for everybody. And then you get the blogs, where obviously you might get somebody who's really specialised. So some of the some of the blogs that I've read, I mean, they're fascinating papers. I possibly wouldn't have picked them myself, but that's you know that's not because it applies to me. If I'm working in a field of you know catalysis, then there are some amazing papers out there that you know I might not have picked from a more general point of view. Mm -hmm. I mean, Ash, you probably have some more thoughts on this. Well, I mean, you know, I I agree with that, and and I think it's again underscore you know it under again underscores how interdisciplinary uh, the field of chemistry is because a lot of these lists, especially by journals like Nature or Science, uh, you know, the, the chemistry related items in those lists are not specifically marked as chemistry. But it's pretty clear, clear that chemistry is a very important underlying component. And it also tells you how diverse the applications of chemistry are. You know, on one hand, you have curiosity. On the other hand, you have drug discovery. You have catalysis. You have ribosomes. So, so I think, again, um, you know, I just get the feeling that chemistry is sort of like the silent actor in a lot of these plays. And it's not always, you know, there's not always a bright light shining on it. But uh, the presence of that silent actor is ubiquitous. I know that there's uh, some live tweeting going on at the hashtag TopChem. Lauren, is there anything coming in there? Any questions or comments? Um, I just updated, and I didn't see any particular questions. So I think we can, we can continue. OK. Well, folks, don't be shy. If you have a question or want to interject your favorite, use the hashtag TopChem on Twitter. Any other findings or moments um, that people want to talk about? I know that um, I know that Ash, for you, I think you, you wanted to make the point that it's not just about research in 2013; it can be about the people as well. Yeah, that's right, and and I think part of it is also highlighting some of the less uh, savory aspects of chemistry. You know, not everything, not all the news related to chemistry was uh, feel good and positive, uh, but you also had uh, stories like the story of Annie Dukan who was convicted on uh, messing up essentially what was a chemical protocol uh, that was supposed to accurately uh, convict people or, or prove their innocence. And I know you covered that story a lot. And definitely, you know, chemistry is, 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 at, is at the heart of that story. So maybe you, you want to say something more. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, in, in forensic science, uh, it's um, a big problem that a lot of the sciences that are going into forensic science aren't validated sciences. But that wasn't the problem here. We had chemical analysis, drug, um, you know, identification, very, very basic stuff that done properly would have worked to make a case for or against um, a person's having committed the crime. But what happened here was someone just making up data because of incredible workload, wanting to feel maybe like, like they were helping, but just, I, there, there's a lot more to come out of that case, and I do want to, I want to get to that. Um, but uh, any, Laura, Lauren, well, other, other thoughts about, um, about I was just going to say, linked to that is also the fact that we've had, especially in the latter half of 2013, we started to see these issues of data manipulation, issues in the, in the literature and, and problems there and um, you know none of that's really been totally resolved I don't think and I have this horrible feeling that um, what we might have is something almost of a tip of the iceberg as, as, as we start looking for more I, I have this feeling that you know in the same way as Annie Duke and a couple of things got noticed and then you realized how many cases were affected I have um, I do think that similarly you know you've got this pressure to publish or perish there's all these you know, and it's not to excuse it, but I think perhaps the drivers that led to issues coming along with data manipulation or whatever you want to call it, there could be more of that to come, definitely. 
Yeah. On a you know, on a more positive note, I think there's there's good stuff <laughs> as well, and there's been some great work that people have been doing. I don't want to I don't want to sound a negative, completely negative sort of argument there. <laughs> and no, I think yeah. some of the, some of the work that um, also with more people embracing blogging on a more sort of you know laboratory basis as well. So people starting to do more sort of open uh, lab uh, blogging has been really, really great, I think. I'm thinking especially of, you know, the Baron blog that we've, we've had. I, th I found that really fascinating to sort of actually get a bit, of, bit more to and fro about what they're actually doing and, and, and what the results they're getting and how they're getting them. Mm -hmm. I think that openness should be really um, encouraged. Yeah, they, there, there are a few... Um academics in chemistry that are sort of playing with that medium. Barron's obviously one of the more visible, but uh, I know um, Andre Uden at Toronto, he, uh, he started a blog while he was on sabbatical. I guess he figured that was a good time to dip a toe in, and I know that he's, you know, experimenting with the medium, and we are seeing more chemists on Twitter, on other social networks. I, I think that this is going to, that's going to be it may be a gradual thing rather than a this is this will be the year of the <laughs> you, you know what I mean yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's it's good to see oh, Laura sorry Lauren did you have a okay can if you have a comment Laura go ahead no 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 you go oh I was going to change the topic so um, I, I'm just seeing some questions now coming in on Twitter um, the one thing that we haven't talked about yet in terms of one of the top chemistry stories of the year, and, um, you know, I know that both CNN and Chemistry World highlighted this with some of those beautiful AFM images of yes. hydrogen-bonded molecules and of an actual chemical reaction. And so uh, someone's asking, we've seen differences in bond lengths and seen h bond. What are we going to see next? Uh, you mean what are we going to see next in, in, in the field? Yeah. It, does anybody have any insights into that? I mean, I think watching chemical reactions is about the coolest thing that, that you can see. And, and I think we have just scratched the surface of, of that aspect of it. So, you know, I would expect more things like cyclizations or multi-step reactions. I mean, just, just think of being able to visualize a multi-step reaction uh, you know, like one of the one of those reactions that you see in steroid biosynthesis, for instance, uh, where there's one carbocation and there's maybe eight or ten bonds that close on top of each other uh, to uh, you know to pump electrons into into that carbocation. I, I I think something like that would be really cool. Yeah, I mean, the, the, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to say, I think one of the cool things, you know, I was rereading some of these stories to prepare for this chat, but one of the cool things about that um, H bond or hydrogen bonding story was that they saw, you know, hydrogen bonds between carbon and hydrogen. That was something that for a long time was thought not really possible. So I'm wondering if we're going to see more things like that where maybe something happens that wasn't really expected. Right, and, and I think that's, that's a really good point because uh, you folks probably know that about two or three years ago they had this big conference on uh, defining a hydrogen bond at, uh, which was organized by IUPAC and, and the International Union of Crystallography. And they essentially greatly expanded the definition of hydrogen bonding to take into account interactions like CHC hydrogen bonding or CHO hydrogen bonding. Uh, and, and these kinds of studies certainly uh, uh, make us feel like uh, like that expanded definition is, is, is on the right track. That, uh, I feel like, is a good segue into the what should we be watching for 2014 in terms of chemistry? Well, if I go first, I think one of the um, interesting uh, areas has been a lot of developments in, you know, trying to make materials for solar power, solar capture, um, and one of the big things is obviously they're not very efficient, and, you know, in comparison perhaps to what we'd like them to be, and also they just use these really expensive metals. Um, I think one of the, the really interesting things, we've started to see a couple of papers come through, um, perovskites, trying to make sort of lead-free perovskites, we haven't got there quite yet for solar cells, I know Ash probably wanted to talk about that a bit, and also these mixed metal oxides that they're starting to make 
um, which are really, you know, you're talking about iron and cobalt and nickel rather than really, really expensive um, metals. And I, 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 have a, I have a feeling that we're going to start looking a lot more at these sort of trying to come back up the periodic table a bit and trying to get back into those slightly more, you know, abundant uh, sort of transition metals for catalysis. I think that's going to be something to really look out for. Well, I, you know, on, a, on a different note, on a non-research related note, uh, I think, Carmen, we mentioned uh, uh, earlier that, uh, uh, well, in, in one of our previous hangouts, we mentioned that we would like to ideally see some kind of a conclusion uh, to the Patrick Harron Sherry Sangji case at UCLA. And, you know, my personal feeling about that is that uh, I think it has dragged on for a really long time. And I'm sure there were sound legal reasons for that delay. Uh, but I'm pretty sure that both the parties would, would like to see some kind of a conclusion and, and get some kind of a closure uh, in, a, in, a, in a very unfortunate case which has been going on for a while. Absolutely. I, I don't have uh, much to add other than what our, um, our reporter Jillian Kelmsley covers very extensively. But mm -hmm. that I, w I will say that, you know, the fact that it dragged on probably isn't surprising given the way legal proceedings work, but mm -hmm. I, I do wonder, you know, what what hopefully the case itself may come to some kind of head this year. But I, what needs to happen for the chemistry community as well is sort of some kind of larger, broader regulation that I I don't see happening, even on a year time scale. These culture changes take a lot of time. Yeah. Yeah. I, in terms of, I, I, we had talked about Annie Dukin earlier, I can say that I, the word is that in January, later of this month, actually, a report is due to come out from the Massachusetts Inspector General's office detailing not just Dukin herself, but the management and oversight and running of the lab itself, kind of the what went wrong how can we prevent this in the future kind of conversation. So that will provide a little more clarity into that particular case. Although um, I've since learned in reporting the story that it's nowhere near the first forensic crime lab scandal and that there are larger patterns relating to lab management, lab accreditation that are really going to need to be looked at. Um, and there's a National Academies report that's now many years old that the recommendations still haven't been heeded. So hmm. something else to think about. Absolutely. And and you know just just from a research standpoint, I I, I think uh, you know I'm I'm also very excited about the clarity technique that that uh, Lauren mentioned, and I think the you know the Brain Map project, the initiative is certainly going to take off uh, next year. There's going to be much more debate about it. So. Uh, hopefully, you know, we can expect a lot more cool things, uh, so at least some of them, including chemistry, uh, to come out of neuroscience in 2014. Sure, so. yeah. I, I was going to bring this up as, you know, my sort of thing to look at in 2014. And, you know, the BRAIN initiative was announced in April. Um, there have been a lot of people working behind the scenes to get it off the ground. Um, and, you know, there's been, there's been a lot of debate over it amongst neuroscientists especially. Uh, I think people are worried that, you know, funding is going to be diverted only into these particular areas. And I think there's been a lot of confusion about exactly what the BRAIN initiative is and what it's going to fund. But I think the one area for chemists to look towards is this um, interface between neuroscience and nanotechnology. I mean, that's one of the, the tool development things that they've been pushing in this. And there are a lot of people um, working on these things, new probes uh, for measuring the, the chemical um, neurotransmitters and the, the you know, nerve firing brain, things like that, um, new, new fluorescent probes and ways of um, doing that molecularly and guy uh, things of putting nanoparticles in there that can report back on things with open up and open up the brain. Um, so I think that's certainly nice to watch. And, and you know, even though it is very neuroscience-y, uh, you know, it, it's been it's been compared to the Human Genome Project. And I think that that has had a lot of impact on chemistry. And I think mm -hmm. this. 
Yeah. Well, I want to. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh no. I yeah. I was just going to say on the on the you know there's there's also another thing that we can hopefully look forward to, and that's uh, on the business side or on the on the commerce side of chemistry. I mean, you know, we had to remember that uh, 2013 uh, was slightly better for the chemical industry and the pharmaceutical industry compared to some of the years before that. But even then, you had news of uh, pretty massive layoffs, especially the 8,000 layoffs that Merck announced. And so I, I really hope all of us can look forward to, to a better 2014 in, in that regard, too. Here's hoping. Um, I, I'll put in a plug for another scientific um, aspect. 2014 is the International Year of Crystallography, and mm. so we should expect to see some celebrations regarding that. Um, one of the papers that stood out for me in 2013 was actually right smack dab at the end, and it was um, relating to the crystallography of G-protein coupled receptors. Right. But uh, in theory, it's, it's something that could apply more generally. Um, the idea is that you have to get a crystal big enough to solve your crystal structure in protein crystallography. That's something of a black art and a bottleneck. And the researchers in the work, it was led by Vadim Sharazov at Scripps, um, Ray Stevens, also a collaborator, a big name in GPCR crystallography. They developed a new injection system that allows you to crystallize what essentially amounts to a gelatinous stream of very tiny crystals rather than one or a couple of big honking crystals. So that may be a help in solving some of these many membrane protein structures that are, many of which are drug targets, many of which have yet to be solved. So, right. and, 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 and I think that's, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I think one of the really neat things about that paper is that it also allows you to study the dynamic motion of the GPCRs because, you know, you have a stream of the proteins, so you're not really immobilizing them as much as you traditionally would. And, and I think that's really import for, important for understanding, uh, let's say, specific intermediate states to which uh, drugs might bind and stabilize those states and, and things like that. Yeah, I'd also say I think we've seen a lot actually this year. We always see quite a lot of strange bonding phenomena coming up, you know, even salt, I think, at the end of the last year, being yes. put under pressure and having weird new uh, new structures. And uh, and I think hopefully with this uh, focus on crystallography, we can really start looking at uh, the weird and wonderful world of uh, bonding and uh, and things that we might take for granted. It might not actually be as simple as we, uh, we like to think, or we certainly we teach and we learn. I, I think I found that a lot. There's, you know, you learn one thing at school, you learn another thing at, you know, at undergrad, another thing later on, and then again and again you find out that what you've learned, what you assume is is, is wrong, and it's all, or if not wrong, at least a a, a, a different version. And it's, uh, I think, I think there could be some really interesting things with that. Right. And I, and I'm sorry, but since we are talking about about crystallography, I, you know, I think it's worth noting. Another paper that came out in 2013, which was the crystal structure of the non-classical carbocation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I think most uh, most people who are listening to this uh, to this hangout are probably you know not old enough to have lived through that controversy, but uh, but I think it was one of those uh, chemical controversies where people uh, were literally at each other's throats, and uh, and it seems that that controversy has finally been resolved after, what, 50 or 55 years now uh, with this crystal structure. And, and, and I think the people who, who actually found the crystal structure, the, the team in Germany, uh, they had to go to, a, you know, extreme lengths to cool down the crystals. And they, so they claimed that they had spent a small fortune on getting all the helium uh, that was necessary to cool the system down. And uh, you know maybe that accounts for all this helium shortage that people are talking about. <laughs> well, I was I was gonna fo follow you on by saying yeah, I mean you get we keep talking about the helium shortage and the helium shortage and you know may maybe this <laughs> this is why. Yeah. It, maybe it's not just party balloons that everyone keeps talking about. <laughs> um, we're we're coming up toward the end. Lauren, do we have any last uh, a last question perhaps from the tweet stream? Um, there was just a question that came in about um, maybe talking about the top events in polymer chemistry this year, if anybody has any thoughts on that. Ooh. Interesting. Um, 
remember reading something about self-healing polymers. But, but yeah, I'm, that's the one I was going to pick as well. There was this uh, self-healing polymer where you could actually cut it and then put it back together, and it would it would reheal. I mean, self-healing materials has been something people have worked on for a while. Or wasn't um, the pol the tagline something like "Polymer, heal thyself"? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. Sad. I remember that now and didn't. <laughs> no. I think we made some Terminator references in uh, in uh, in Chemistry World. Something about you know I'll be back. <laughs> yes. Yes, I remember that one. <laughs> <sighs> well, I think it's uh, we've about run out of time. Um, thank you, everyone who tuned in and followed along and tweeted along and commented, and uh, we will. Look forward to more hangouts soon. And I just want to say a very nice thank you to our guests, Laura and Ash. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for having me. All righty. Uh, in that case, we'll sign off. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye now. Bye.